Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the second annual AWS Healthcare and Life Sciences Web Day. My name is Shaz Partovi. I'm Worldwide Lead for Healthcare, Life Sciences, and Genomics at AWS. Uh, welcome to the keynote presentation, where I have the pleasure of introducing a number of customers and partners who are going to take us on a journey of accelerating global COVID response. We're going to go all the way from outbreak prediction to vaccine protection. Um, before I uh, introduce our great uh, keynote presenters, I just want to tell you a little about the AWS Healthcare Life Science Practice in case you haven't really met us virtually. Um, as you know, AWS has been around for about 14 years and we've had a dedicated healthcare and life science practice for about seven years. We've had a chance to uh, recruit some terrific talent, um, individuals that have been at the bench, that have been at the bedside, physicians, nurses, uh, biochemists, informaticists, uh, researchers, who've all been in the industry and have decided after a career in the industry to actually come and work at AWS um, to work with terrific customers and partners like yourself. And um, speaking of our uh, customers and partners, we have the pleasure of enjoying a very large network of um, uh, industry giants, as well as startups, as well as partners um, across the world. And really what is really exciting to us is that if we look at the mission vision statement of any one of you, your organizations, we're likely to see one common word in all of them, and I, I'm willing to wager there's a reference to a patient. We recognize that each one of you are working uh, to advance uh, human life, to do better for civilizations, and so we are delighted to be here working in the healthcare life science practice to help you elevate the human condition. So that really gives us great solace, and we love what we do in that regard. So today, as I said, I'm going to introduce a number of terrific customers and partners that are going to take us the journey of how AWS is helping support the race against COVID. And, and you'll certainly see common themes. There'll be a lot of reference to machine learning and, and, and artificial intelligence and accelerating time to value. And we're going to go in uh, and review all of them. Before I introduce each of these speakers to you, I'll just give you a high level um, to stitch it all together. And then we'll take in turn and go through those um, presentations. So let's start with Blue Dot in Toronto, Canada. Blue Dot is a company that um, is harvesting uh, all the publications uh, across the world in about 65 different languages and applying in those signals in those publications, they're applying machine learning and uh, 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 powered by AWS and, and natural language processing to identify signals and trends. And they were one of the companies that were the earliest identifiers of um, a signal that said, there's a respiratory outbreak in Wuhan, China. Um, so they combined all that data across the world to identify uh, early detection and perform global surveillance. From Toronto, let's go across the pond to um, uh, London. Uh, we'll hear from LifeBit. LifeBit is a partner of AWS, which um, focuses on uh, genomic uh, uh, analysis. Uh, so we're going from sort of textual analysis of the text of the world to the genomic level analysis of what, what they do is use the massive scale and compute power of AWS to load the sequencing that's done um, and then apply secondary analysis, do variant calling, and then do tertiary analysis and, and assist with interpretation of what those what does that mean. And what they're doing is helping identify if there are trends and if there are predilections to COVID in particular kind of um, geno uh, genetic makeup of, of humans. So we'll hear from LifeBit. So from London, let's uh, fly back over to Vancouver, Canada. We'll hear from uh, Abcelera. Abcelera is uh, a, a company that is focused on early drug discovery. And what they actually do is take a sample of blood from patients, uh, well, one of the things they do, <laughs> take a sample of blood from uh, patients that have already had COVID and actually label the antibodies and then use machine uh, vision on AWS to actually look at five and a half million individual cells to identify the kind of antibody that could be converted into a drug to be given to patients that would have COVID. So uh, that's incredible. Uh, you know, you couldn't do that manually looking at five and a half million cells to identify antibodies and they use uh, machine vision on AWS to perform that. So uh, we go from drug discovery in, in, in Vancouver, let's go down, drop down to San Diego where a, a terrific team of researchers there um, applied machine learning to uh, chest experts to identify um, uh, early signs of COVID infection and to actually apply um, machine learning so that those films that are likely to represent COVID infections can be elevated in this, in this sort of the queue and be reviewed by the radiologists and the physicians quickly to accelerate time to treatment. So we'll hear from UCSD um, and, uh, and the work they've done there. So from San Diego, let's uh, hop over to 
back to London, we'll hear from uh, Babylon. Babylon um, uses machine learning um, and applied to language. And what, 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 what's there is that you can actually, patients to be able to improve access to care are able to actually have a natural language text conversation um, to get um, um, a diag uh, to get a triaging performed, so whether they can be reassured to stay at home, whether they need to have a video visit right there, or whether they need to go have uh, diagnostic testing because they might have COVID. And again, this is uh, applying incredible uh, machine learning uh, and AI to a conversational agent that's supported by AI to be able to uh, answer people at scale. And finally, um, we'll hear from Moderna. Moderna is an organization that focused on creating um, uh, drugs based on messenger RNA, and, and in this case, they're using um, uh, the compute power at scale and uh, to look at how to go from, uh, to identify the path from uh, the messenger RNA that is for COVID to a protein family that can be used for a vaccine, and we hear that story from Moderna and uh, their path to accelerating a, a vaccine identification. So taken as a whole, we're going to go right across the spectrum from left to right, from global surveillance to genomic research. Uh, to drug discovery, to diagnostic intelligence, um, to access to care through virtual virtualization, uh, all the way to um, accelerating uh, uh, vaccine development. And I invite you to listen for areas where AI, ML, and or compute at scale or storage at scale can help accelerate these and how AWS supports those. Uh, so let's go ahead and begin with Blue Dot. As I mentioned, Blue Dot is a company based in Toronto, Canada. Um, and we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Kamran Khan. Dr. Khan is the founder and CEO of Blue Dot, a startup that uses AI to understand disease outbreaks and was one of the first to raise the alarm about an impending pandemic. I'd like to pass the mic to Dr. Khan. Well, thank you, Shez, uh, and to AWS for inviting me to be a part of this forum. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about using machine learning uh, to mitigate risk from emerging infectious diseases. Now, this story actually goes back 17 years. Um, I was just beginning my career as an academic infectious disease physician in Toronto back in 2003, when this virus that nobody had ever seen or heard of before showed up in our city, uh, infected a number of frontline healthcare workers, as well as hundreds of different citizens, um, and really crippled our city for four very long months. Uh, that uh, virus was SARS-CoV. And uh, it really was the motivation for uh, all of the work I've been doing as a clinician and an academic, and more recently as an entrepreneur, in developing solutions to prevent or mitigate uh, the impacts of emerging infectious diseases. Now, one of the things we learned during the SARS outbreak was that you know, the world is rapidly changing and we're seeing dangerous outbreaks appear with greater frequency, scale, and impact. But the world is also changing in ways that can play to our advantage. We have growing access to big data, advanced analytics like machine learning and other forms of artificial intelligence, and digital technologies that can enable, enable us to disseminate knowledge and spread knowledge around the world faster than any outbreak uh, is able to spread. Now, in order to realize that vision, we need a global early warning system for infectious diseases. And this has really been foundational to the work that we have been doing at Blue Dot for the last seven years. So let me walk you through what some of the key pillars are of this early warning system. Now first, uh, if we've learned one thing with COVID-19, it's that time really matters. And early detection of the threat is critical. This gives us the time to be able to intervene and ultimately to be able to change the course of an outbreak. The second issue is that outbreaks spread really quickly in our hyperconnected world. They can quickly jump across countries or even across continents and, and have an impact. The third pillar is really around disruption. Now, infectious diseases spread around the world all the time. I see them as a practicing clinician where I see patients who've returned from different parts of the world with illnesses that they've acquired during their travels. Uh, but they don't all cause outbreaks, let alone trigger pandemics. And how can we anticipate which types of events might actually lead to further disruption and new outbreaks and which ones uh, will not? And then ultimately, how can we minimize the impact of that disruption? And finally, we have to be able to disseminate these insights, get them into the hands of those who need them so they can take the appropriate uh, timely actions to protect themselves and to protect others. Now, these pillars 
have to be integrated. It's not enough for them to be sitting in isolation. We need to go from early detection to an assessment of dispersion and disruption, and then ultimately communicating that information uh, in a very timely manner. So I'm gonna say a little bit about our, the first pillar in early detection. And we've been using machine learning to enhance the detection of global threats around the world and to do this in near real time. Now, one of the things we learned during the SARS outbreak was that if we wait for official reports of outbreaks through government public health agencies, we may not always get that information in the most timely manner uh, as we would like. The internet has become an important medium for gathering information about possible outbreaks even before they're reported officially. This can be through the world's online media, through health blogs and other forums. Um, and our data scientists and data engineers and clinicians have been building a platform that is gathering information on over 150 different diseases and syndromes in 65 languages and collecting this information every 15 minutes, 24 hours a day. Now that's obviously a lot of data to process. Uh, and this is where natural language processing and machine learning comes into play. And we've been using NLP and machine learning powered by AWS to extract vital pieces of information, the name of the pathogen, the location and the time of the outbreak and other contextual data such as case counts or deaths and so forth. So what we're ultimately doing here is using these analytical tools to take vast amounts of unstructured text data and to organize and structure it into spatio-temporal data where we know the place and time and the name of the pathogen. Now we use this platform to pick up news of an outbreak of pneumonia in Wuhan back on the morning of December 31st by translating an article in Chinese and ultimately having the machine presented to our team as a threat that we should be paying attention to. Now, we also know that outbreaks can spread very quickly. There are billions of us that board commercial flights every single year, uh, and certainly we, we travel around the world with, with record speed. That's obviously less so today with COVID-19, but certainly at the time that COVID-19 was emerging, populations were moving rapidly across the planet. Our surveillance system is connected with data on the entire world's commercial air traffic. Uh, this includes information on all of the flight schedules as they are moving around the planet, as well as the anonymized final destinations of travelers around the world. So this image here shows you uh, in circles the final destinations of travelers leaving Wuhan uh, back at the end of 2019. Uh, you can see many of those large circles are in East Asia. And then you'll see these arcs, these lines that are the nonstop flights departing Wuhan to different places around the world. Some of them you'll see in Europe and places like Italy and France and the UK. But also, if we look further west into North America, you will see nonstop flights into San Francisco and into New York City. Now, we were sufficiently concerned about COVID-19, actually even before it had that name, back in early January. Uh, in fact, here you will see a publication that we submitted to the scientific literature uh, where it was referred to as a pneumonia of unknown etiology in Wuhan and looking at the potential for international dispersion through commercial air travel. Using these analytics, we identified the top 20 cities that we thought would be at greatest risk of impact if COVID-19 was, was to continue to spread and spread ultimately outside of mainland China. What you'll see here is in red dots, these cities were among the very first cities that were impacted by COVID-19. In Bangkok, you see at the top of the list, was in fact the very first city that reported a case of COVID-19 outside of mainland China. And so we published these results back on January 8th because ultimately what we wanted to do was to make sure that these data and analytics were available to the scientific and public health community to inform decisions and anticipate how this outbreak might spread. Now, as we think about the spread of COVID-19 into distant cities around the world, um, ultimately, one of the key public health interventions for slowing its spread is social distancing. Uh, and we've had the opportunity of working with the state of California in looking at social distancing interventions using anonymous data. I want to underscore anonymous data that's aggregated uh, to understand population mobility. These are derived from mobile devices um, and ultimately are important and valuable intelligence 
so that public health officials can utilize their finite human resources in the most effective, efficient, and coordinated manner possible. Um, and so here is a visualization of some of the population mobility across Los Angeles over a 24-hour period. Now, another critical factor in the last D of the four Ds I described is dissemination. How do we get this information out to those who need it? Now, the typical time to awareness today is such that government public health agencies are the first to learn about this. This is actually very much in their job, uh, and they ultimately need to be looking at what threats are appearing, not only in their own countries, but elsewhere in the world. After government, the information tends to trickle down to the healthcare providers, and then finally to industry, and ultimately to the public. This is not really an ideal way of disseminating information. What we really need is a mechanism for contempor contemporaneous dissemination of these insights, so that the public health community has information about epidemic threats that are appearing around the world, and perhaps even some of the data and analytics that we're describing here uh, can supplement the existing capacity of the public health system. But it is critically important that these insights also make it to the frontline healthcare providers. Now, I say this as a practicing physician who finds myself in the emergency department seeing patients from around the world who come back with illnesses. The difference between one case of an illness in a traveler and an outbreak that can cripple the city is an astute clinician. And, and this is so critical because sick patients don't go to the public health department, they wind up in the emergency department. And this is a very, very important piece of how we need to be empowering the frontline healthcare workers so they can better protect themselves and better protect the rest of us. And finally, when we think about global businesses and enterprises, they all have a responsibility to take care of their employees, their most valuable assets. For some businesses, taking care of their customers and all businesses really to be thinking about disruptions in business continuity and supply chains that can really impact the financial resilience of their organizations. So as we look past this COVID-19 crisis and think about how do we prevent some of the health and economic and social consequences of an outbreak like COVID-19, it's to be using big data and analytics to be able to detect outbreaks around the world quickly, to anticipate how they may be able to spread, to anticipate what their impacts and consequences may be, and ultimately then to disseminate insights to empower the whole of society uh, so that we can mitigate the consequences that we have been seeing with COVID-19, the severe health and economic and social impacts uh, of a dangerous infectious disease. So with that note, I'd like to thank you, uh, Shez and AWS for inviting me to be a part of this forum. And, and Shez, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you now. Thanks, Kamran. It's incredible to think how this type of technology can better predict where contagious clusters are occurring and potentially identify uh, future larger outbreaks. Thanks so much. Now let's uh, go uh, from analyzing text to analyzing genomics um, and harvesting insights at the gene level. We're gonna go from Toronto to London and we're going to hear from Dr. Maria Hatsu Dunford, who is the CEO and founder of LifeBit, a technology company that's launched a new research platform for Genomics England. Um, this team, in partnership with Genomic Consortium and the NHS, are set to deliver whole genome sequencing for 35,000 COVID positive patients to help researchers better understand the underlying genetic factors of disease. Thanks, Dr. Hatsu Dunford, for joining us. I'm going to pass the mic to you. Thank you, Shez. I am delighted to be here and take you through how, with AWS, we are supporting the UK government response against COVID-19, as well as the Genomics England new research environment. We are now living in the era of the genomics revolution. To get your, your genome sequenced today, it will cost you less than $500. Soon, it will be less than 100, meaning that every person that can afford to buy a mobile phone can actually afford to get their DNA data sequenced. As a result of this, by 2025, we're gonna be having the genomes of more than 500 million individuals sequenced. And if you think that the size of every genome is around 120 gigabytes, then genomic data is bound to be the largest data on planet Earth 
surpassing astronomical data, as well as the data produced by Twitter and YouTube combined, as estimated by the Sanger Institute. But why should we care about this? Well, when genomic information is utilized properly, then we can reduce the time to diagnosis by 75%. And that is extremely important, especially when we are trying to diagnose patients with rare diseases and complex diseases like cancer. Furthermore, drugs that target genetic biomarkers have six times better chances of getting FDA approval than other drugs. In fact, every second drug that FDA approves today is a personalized medicine drug, which means that it's a drug that can be personalized to patients on the basis of their genomic information. And now, genomics is getting a central stage in the fight against COVID-19. The UK government has established a consortia around Genomics England, the NHS and the main institutions to collect, with the mission to collect critical data. To reinforce this effort, a partnership with leading technology companies has also been established. Illumina for the DNA sequencing, AWS for the cloud, and LifeBit for the end-to-end -end research platform. This is truly an unprecedented effort for any one disease. The genomic, clinical, and phenotypic data to be made available will be coming from 20,000 COVID-19 patients that have been submitted to intensive care units, as well as an additional of 15,000 COVID-19 patients with mild coronavirus symptoms. This data will be further complemented by the Genomics England existing data coming from the 100,000 individuals uh, of the historic cohort. Collectively, all of this data will be made available to leading pharmaceutical companies and research organizations across the world in an effort to accelerate finding drugs and vaccines, as well as improve the diagnosis and the prevention of the disease. However, making the data available is simply not enough. We also need to make this data extremely usable, as well as enable all of the organizations that do have access to this data to be able to combine this data with publicly available data, as well as their own private data sets to run joint analysis on the data. Now, the problem here is that all of this data is distributed across different locations and different data silos, making combining of this data almost impossible. Furthermore, this data is very complex and comes in different types, formats, and standards. Once more, making the usability of this data also a very difficult task. The solution, federated technology. When combined with the power of cloud, federated technology can provide access to distributed data and allow for it to be analyzed as one. Further, with the right system in place, this diverse and unstructured data can be standardized and made usable. And when we truly combine the data and make them usable, then what we see is that for every 10 time increase on the data, we see up to a 10x increase on the relevant scientific findings. And it is this transformational power of federated technology that we are bringing to Genomics England together with AWS. Now, every researcher across the world can access, query, and collaborate seamlessly over this data. They can further bring 
and use any analytical tools over this data. Finally, and more importantly, they can combine the genomics inland data with their own data and publicly available data to run joint analysis over all data uh, as if the data was in one place, when in reality, the data has never moved from its original location. Now, the common goal of all of this is to identify the genetic variances that can explain why some individuals get, um, get affected severely by COVID-19, where others get mild symptoms or they're completely asymptomatic. If we do understand these differences, then we will be able to find targets for drugs and for vaccines, as well as massively improve the diagnosis and the prevention of the disease. And it's this end-to-end -end solution that we have deployed over the Genomics England AWS Cloud. It is a unified digital research environment built to support data coming from up to 10 million plus individuals, 3 billion genetic variants, and millions of phenotypic, clinical, and other annotations. This unified digital research environment also provides an interface uh, with all of the tools needed to query, analyze, and visualize the data. If you want to know more about it, my colleague Torben will be giving a talk in the life sciences and uh, the life sciences technology track. COVID-19 has brought the potential of genomics at the forefront. Yet, the genomic revolution is well underway on other diseases, especially rare diseases and cancer. And it is not just biobanks that need to think how to analyze genomics data at scale and in place without the risk of data transfer. Every pharmaceutical and research organization out there has to act now. Because it is proven that when genomics data is properly utilized, especially in combination with other types of data, it can deliver better drugs and better treatments faster. And with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention and invite you to reach out to have a discussion how with AWS we can help future-proof your organization. Now I'll pass it back to Shez. Thanks, Maria. This work in your platform can help researchers to understand why some patients are more susceptible to the virus and more, and some get more severely ill than others. This information can also help um, identify potential of the therapies. And so speaking of therapies, let's go ahead and go from uh, London to Vancouver, Canada. And in the race to find effective therapy, we're going to hear from a team uh, that is uh, trying to understand and characterize SARS-CoV-2 in the hopes of uh, identifying an effective drug. Now for this, um, we're going to hear from Dr. Carl Hansen, the CEO of Abcelera. Um, Carl will tell us how they use microfluidics, machine vision, genomics, and artificial intelligence to find the right antibody that may have potential to treat and prevent COVID-19. Thank you, Shez. Uh, in the next 10 minutes, I'd like to take the opportunity to share with you uh, a technology platform that's been built at Abcelera over the past eight years that is focused on solving some of the toughest problems in the therapeutic industry, the discovery of new therapeutic antibodies, and how investments in that technology positioned Abcelera at the forefront of the response to COVID-19 uh, and working with our partners, Eli Lilly, allowed us to go from a first screen of a human patient sample to a first in human testing of a therapeutic antibody in a record speed of three months. If you work in the biotechnology industry, your overarching goal is always to take basic science and translate it into new therapies for patients. If you work in the bio biotechnology industry, um, you would also agree that that process, while we've done uh, terrific things over the past few years, still needs to be improved. It takes too long, it costs too much, and it fails too often. The statistics are that drug discovery typically takes anywhere from five to 15 years, that it succeeds less than 5% of the time, and that it costs over a billion dollars for approved molecules. There are many reasons for that, of course. Biology is complicated, and we don't yet understand everything we need to know to direct new therapeutic programs. There are challenges in the regulatory environment. 
and there are challenges in starting a business and growing it so that you can bring a market, you can bring a drug ultimately to the market. But we believe that one of the biggest problems and one of the biggest barriers is that the industry and many technologies are focused on the end game, on bringing new therapies to patients. And while that is a laudable goal, we also need firms, technology firms, not biotech firms, that are investing in the solutions to make the process faster and to sharpen the axe of drug discovery. Absolver was founded with that idea, that we would invest long-term in teams and technologies and work broadly with the biotech industry from small firms to large firms, because we believe that if we can put the best science and the best innovators in touch with the best technologies, we'll get faster drugs to patients and everyone wins. The arena that we work in is the adaptive immune system. Uh, over the past 10 years, it's been widely recognized that biology is quickly turning into a data science and nowhere is this more true than in adaptive immunity. Uh, each of us has within us the ability to make up to 100 trillion different antibodies. And at any point, we're making only a billion different molecules. Those molecules, that collection of antibodies, is unique to each person, and it represents a database of antibodies within us. The antibody repertoire, or diversity that we have, encodes the state of our health, and it remembers our previous exposure to infection and disease. Unfortunately, up until now, we've had very few tools to allow us to search through the universe of antibodies inside. Ultimately, doing that is a single cell analysis problem. Each antibody in your body is created by an individual immune cell called a B cell that has within it a DNA code that makes that specific molecule. In order to search the immune system, we have to be able to analyze the antibodies made by millions of different uh, B cells to break them open, to understand their DNA code, and ultimately to use that information for change, to create new therapeutics or new vaccines that can promote human health. Over the past eight years, Absar has been working on that, on that problem and has built a full technology stack that allows us to search, to decode, and to analyze natural immune systems. We start by accessing a sample that has within it antibody diversity. That could be a blood sample from a patient that's recovered from a virus, or it could be a tissue from an animal that's been immunized against a drug target. We then apply our platform to search through millions of different immune cells to find the immune cells that make antibodies against the target and that have the properties that we want, to decode them by breaking up their DNA, and finally to analyze the data on those antibodies to quickly select the molecules that are most likely to move quickly forward into therapeutic development. Uh, that effort has been built over eight years uh, and is the work of over 160 employees that include data scientists, engineers, biologists, and mathematicians. And is a technology platform that brings together tools from engineering, from the computational sciences, and from the life sciences. Uh, we've honed this technology by working on over 55 drug discovery programs, uh, and through that work and collaborating with partners, have hardened the technology and figured out how to accelerate the path from an idea to a drug. Two years ago, uh, on the basis of our efforts in technology development for drug discovery, we entered into a program that was being advanced by the Department of Defense through an agency called DARPA, or the Defense Advanced Research Programs Agency. DARPA, if you don't know, is the same agency that is responsible for far-reaching research ideas and brought to us technologies like GPS and the internet in the past. Within the P3 program, the objective is to put in place the technologies that allow us to rapidly respond to a viral pandemic by taking a blood sample from a patient that has recovered from a, a viral infection and that has within it antibodies that can help to fight the virus, to searching through that immune system to identify the antibodies that can stop the virus and also that are safe for patients and be, can be quickly manufactured so that they can be brought back to the population either as a therapeutic or as a prophylactic to be a firebreak for the spread of the pandemic. Through that program, we had the opportunity to pressure test our technology stack in simulated pandemic exercises, the first of which was against a coronavirus called Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS, and the second, which was against pandemic influenza in 2019. Earlier this year, in January, we were preparing for our third capability demonstration, and we're on the phone with collaborators at the NIH uh, Vaccine Research Center discussing an upcoming project to demonstrate the platform on another coronavirus, SARS. It was that very same day that it was announced in the US 
that the first American patient had been identified that had been infected with COVID-19. Immediately after that announcement, we gathered the team in an all-hands meeting and made the decision to abandon the project that we were already working on within P3, and in fact, to deprioritize many projects across the company so that we could bring the majority of our resources onto the problem of getting ready not for a simulated pandemic, but for deployment of our technology in the real thing, to try to find a therapeutic antibody at record speed that could be used to help patients uh, that are infected with COVID-19. For the next month or so, we worked through our network to try to source uh, a patient sample. And on February 25th, we were successful in getting access to what we believe was the first sample available from a US patient that had been infected and had recovered from COVID-19. Uh, four days after receiving the sample, we applied our technology to search through the immune cells within that blood sample to find antibodies that recognize the virus. That search was performed with Abcellera's proprietary microfluidic technology, which is based on credit card sized devices that have within them microfabricated reaction chambers, each the volume of a nanoliter, which is approximately 100,000 times smaller than what would be typically done on a, on a bench scale, and that allows us to analyze antibodies made by individual immune cells one by one, but in a massively parallel format. Over three days, we were able to apply that technology in searching through over 5.8 million immune cells. And from that, we were able to identify uh, 2,200 20, uh, individual cells that made antibodies that, against the virus and that bound to the spike protein. The spike protein on the coronavirus is the main protein responsible for the virus interacting and infecting with your cells. Uh, taking those cells, we then, uh, we then recovered the 2,200 cells, uh, broke them open, and over a period of three days, uh, we sequenced them to decode the DNA sequence uh, that told us not only what the antibody was, but how to make it in the lab. From that analysis, we were able to uh, identify over 500 unique human monoclonal antibodies, uh, which we then expressed and subjected to a battery of tests within the company that use our analytics and automation to generate over 500 data points on each of the antibodies. That resulted in a total collection of over 250,000 data points that needed to be analyzed. And of course, that data was organized and computed on using our backend software. And then our users can interact with that with a visualization tool called Celium, which allows the scientists to interactively explore and filter through hundreds of different antibodies based on large and complex multidimensional data sets. Using that tool, we were able to quickly digest and make a decision based on that data, uh, which allowed us to reduce uh, our set of originally 5.8 million immune cells to 2,200 that bind the virus, to 500 that are specific to the virus and are, are unique, down to a set of 24 that moved into later stage evaluation to see which one would become a drug. Over the following two weeks, we subjected those antibodies to further experiments to determine which was the most effective at stopping the virus and also which would be most easily manufactured quickly so that we could get it to patients uh, as soon as possible. That resulted in the down selection to a single antibody candidate, our drug substance on April 15th, at which point we handed off to our partners, Eli Lilly, which began, uh, sorry, who began GMP manufacturing uh, and brought that antibody extremely quickly through the manufacturing process, through IND submission, and resulting in a first in human testing on June 1st. From end to end, uh, we were able to identify our final drug candidate within six weeks of starting the screen, and six weeks later, or a total of three months after starting the project, had succeeded in having a first in human testing of the first in the world monoclonal antibody against COVID-19. Through all of this process, uh, and also in our ongoing efforts in drug discovery and our future plans to further expand our technology and impact on the industry, it's equally important to have a strong computational platform as it is to have the technologies that allow you to do the experiments on the single cells and to analyze antibodies. We have selected uh, to support this the Amazon Web Service Cloud, and through this work, uh, we used the Elastic Beanstalk, RDS, and Elastic Cloud to support those efforts. Of course, that is a scalable and high-powered computing infrastructure that will grow as we grow as a company. Finally, I, I want to comment that uh, the last four months have been a remarkable time uh, for the world and certainly for Abcellera, uh, as we have found ourselves, uh, by virtue of the technology that we have, at the forefront and able to contribute 
uh, to efforts that are happening across the industry in finding a solution for COVID-19. I also think that this is a perfect example of the reason that we founded the company, uh, and it is that if you invest long-term in the technologies that accelerate drug discovery and build up the teams, uh, then you can move ideas and basic science more quickly uh, from the lab uh, to testing in patients. And that that is best done, of course, when you work collaboratively with partners across the industry. On that note, I'd like to call out uh, the terrific accomplishments and contributions uh, to our program from the Vaccine Research, Research Center at the NIH, uh, the labs of Barney Graham and John Mascola, uh, the senior leadership and the many hundreds of women and men that have put their efforts into this at Eli Lilly, uh, and that have moved at truly remarkable speed through manufacturing and towards clinical development. And finally, for the efforts and uh, vision of DARPA for investing in the basis of technology uh, from which we were able to respond to this pandemic and that has also supported other companies and groups that have a role to play in fighting COVID-19. Uh, thank you, Shez, for the opportunity and back to you. Thanks for joining us, Carl, and showing us how truly fast the research community can move and pull together and collaborate in such times. Um, now let's go ahead and move to um, UCSD. Um, we're going to go from therapy development into disease diagnostics uh, in the healthcare system. And um, we're going to hear from Dr. Mike Hogarth, who is the Clinical Research Information Officer at the University of California in San Diego. Dr. Hogarth and his team at UCSD developed a new artificially intelligent capability powered by AWS to allow healthcare providers to quickly detect pneumonia related to COVID. Thanks, Dr. Hogarth, for joining us. I'm going to pass the mic to you. Thanks, Ches, and uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Hogarth. I'm the Clinical Research Information Officer here at UCSD Health. Uh, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to um, present to you a uh, interesting project uh, related to COVID-19 and a machine learning-based artificial intelligence clinical decision support system that we've put in place um, uh, uh, during this pandemic um, in collaboration with uh, AWS. First, a little bit about UC San Diego Health. We are a, a major academic health system here in the United States. We're ranked seventh uh, in terms of biomedical science and healthcare uh, academic medical centers. We have a significant uh, clinical care uh, practice and footprint here in San Diego, uh, including uh, almost 80,000 emergency department visits uh, a year. Um, we uh, as uh, everybody else has been, uh, been impacted by COVID-19. Um, and I wanted to give you kind of a background on this project um, a, uh, on uh, clinical imaging in that um, when COVID hit, uh, one of the most interesting things about it, uh, as we all know, it's a pulmonary infection, but one of the characteristic uh, features of it is a ground glass opacity appearance on a CT scan, um, which is quite characteristic. Um, uh, and uh, one of the challenges is that although CT scan can detect this uh, fairly readily, um, you can't really CT everyone that shows up with fever, fatigue, and potentially could be a COVID patient. Um, so uh, usually what we do is a screening chest X-ray, um, and if there's something abnormal on the chest X-ray, we proceed to a CT scan. Um, as I mentioned, CTing everybody is very impractical, uh, particularly with COVID-19 patients because of the cleaning procedures that have to happen between patients. It's cost prohibitive, it's quite expensive compared to a chest film uh, that's done in a screening maneuver. And then of course, the radiation exposure is uh, not insignificant. So typically uh, we chest X-ray folks, um, we obtain chest X-rays, um, and if they're abnormal, we, we may proceed with a CT scan. The problem is what happens when you have a very subtle pneumonia and, and uh, not very many symptoms, and we see that with COVID-19 patients. In fact, a number of folks are asymptomatic or may have very mild symptoms and uh, what might appear to be a negative chest X-ray. Um, it turns out that here at UCSD Health, uh, two radiologists in our radiology department, Dr. Albert Chow and Dr. Brian Ert, uh, were working on a uh, chest X-ray um, pneumonia detection clinical decision support system that was uh, based on mach a machine learning based algorithm that they had developed using 22,000 or so 
um, publicly available chest x-rays. None of those are COVID cases, of course. Um, interestingly enough, when COVID hit and people were publishing um, these uh, cases, uh, one of the publications posted uh, chest x-ray uh, images. Um, and so Brian and Albert uh, tried their algorithm on those chest x-ray images, and it turns out it was successful in detecting both normal as well as all of the abnormals, uh, including the subtle pneumonias. And you can see there uh, some of those uh, cases. Um, their algorithm generates a probability map, uh, which uh, is a heat map that gets overlaid on top of the chest X-ray image. So it produces a secondary image, as we call it. So the original is there, and a second uh, copy of that original is created. and um, the probability heat map is overlaid on top of that. And both are viewable by the clinician uh, at a workstation. Um, and uh, I saw Brian uh, uh, and Albert um, present this at a uh, internal conference here. Uh, it was quite interesting. And um, um, uh, when COVID hit, uh, we were um, affected like everybody else. And we already had an AWS environment. Uh, we were sort of toying with the idea at the time of, of implementing this uh, algorithm, but we really didn't, um, we hadn't formulated the project, we didn't quite have um, a good idea of how to uh, proceed. Um, and um, we were having routine meetings with AWS, the healthcare uh, folks, and um, about our environment. And uh, one of those uh, meetings on March 15th, Surprising to, to us, uh, rather than discussing the projects, the team posed the question, how can we help when it comes to COVID-19? It took us aback a little bit, but we had this project that we wanted to do, and, and so we proceeded to discuss it a little bit further, uh, uh, how feasible it might be. It clearly was feasible, and we assembled the team and kicked off the project on March 20th. Uh, just to give everybody context at the time, uh, there were about 4,500 cases or so in the U.S., but a thousand new ones a day and uh, almost a hundred total deaths at the time. Um, in five days from project start to um, the 25th of March, um, we had the infrastructure in place, including connecting uh, the uh, clinical picture archiving communication system, uh, which receives images from uh, the plain radiography modality. Um, and is used here routinely in the radiology practice, we had connected that um, with uh, the images going outbound in real time to our AWS environment through a gateway. Uh, the gateway takes the images, uh, puts it into an EC2 instance where the Python-based machine uh, learning algorithm uh, then analyzes the image, produces the second image or the copy with the uh, heat map overlay, and then both are sent back to the clinical packs so this becomes part of uh, the DICOM images for the case and can be viewed in a PAX workstation uh, in the emergency department. So um, uh, we proceeded to uh, turn that on um, and uh, uh, it, on, on March 25th. Uh, the first uh, 24 hours, uh, we processed 438 chest x-rays. Um, and uh, in the nine weeks since, we've done almost 13,000 uh, chest x-rays. Um, we are currently uh, doing this as an experimental uh, sort of procedure under a study uh, that is overseen by our Institutional Review Board and uh, as an approved study. So this is an uh, uh, experimental intervention, but um, we have already seen some positive impact. We had a case on day three that surprised all of us. Uh, we, uh, one of our, uh, our collaborators, our chief information officer, went into the emergency department and uh, was discussing uh, this uh, with the emergency department physicians. And one of them uh, piped up that they had uh, seen earlier in the day a patient, a 70-year-old gentleman uh, with fatigue, uh, mild fever, and some GI symptoms, no respiratory uh, symptoms whatsoever. Uh, but they got a chest x-ray as part of the routine workup for the abdominal pain and GI discomfort. Um, their initial read was negative. Uh, within four minutes, the 
uh, additional image showed up on the workstation, um, and it showed a, a mild uh, uh, hey, uh, a coloration, which was the AI algorithm pointing out a potential atypical pneumonia. So in this case, they um, had the patient go home, uh, quarantine them, and uh, had them tested uh, for COVID, and turns out this person was COVID positive. We've had a number of cases like that with this algorithm, so we believe that it is definitely beneficial, uh, but we're still studying this, and we look forward to publishing our results um, in the near future. Uh, I wanted to kind of underscore uh, uh, that uh, the benefit of having uh, a HIPAA uh, secure environment in a uh, highly scalable cloud uh, uh, infrastructure, which we had, and then the uh, benefit of having this gateway. Uh, and so in just five days, we were able to implement a real clinical workflow connected to the real clinical PACS imaging system. And with uh, secondary images being added to the DICOM images and provided back to the clinicians at the point of care. Um, uh, I personally have done this for 25 years and have never really seen a, an implementation like this happen so quickly. Um, and uh, this is uh, quite scalable um, and, uh, and, uh, and has uh, worked uh, quite well uh, with uh, minimal issues. So I wanted to thank uh, AWS for the opportunity to present this and also uh, the AWS healthcare team for their help um, in, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a moment of crisis here, um, which we are still in, but uh, is improving little by little. We still have this algorithm in place. And I think what we'll discover is that it's had a significant impact on a number of individual patients um, who might have uh, gone on undetected COVID, uh, infecting not only other patients, but also potentially having a poor outcome because of lack of early detection. Again, I just wanted to thank um, everyone and thank AWS in particular um, um, for the opportunity to present this uh, real case uh, of using um, the AWS environment in a real clinical workflow um, in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us, Mike. It's truly inspiring to see the innovative use of AI to augment physician workflow and helping them efficiently identify patients with possible COVID findings on chest X-ray. And let's move from patient diagnostics to digital health solutions that empower consumers to take a more active role in COVID-19 prevention and diagnostics, diagnosis. And to learn more about this, we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Ali Parsa, founder and CEO of Babylon Health in London, who is going to tell us about Babylon's mission in healthcare and their COVID-19 care assistant. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Parsa. I pass the mic to you. Thank you, Chess, for your kind introduction, and thank you, AWS, for giving me the opportunity to be with you today. We created Babylon some five years ago with a simple aim, with a simple mission to make healthcare accessible and affordable and put it in the hands of every human being on Earth. I'm a physicist, not a very good one, uh, but one thing I learned in physics is that if you dissect every problem into its constituent components, they are easier to solve. So if you look at that statement, to make healthcare affordable nowadays is a lot simpler. As long as we can deliver most of the healthcare most people need on the devices they already have, that will make it much more accessible than what it used to be in the past when people had to travel from the villages, town cities, on the buses, on the cars, into the doctors, uh, surgeries and clinics to be seen. Um, in Rwanda today, we deliver healthcare to the entire population where the government has made digital first primary care universally available to the most remote villages, to the center of the Kigali, to the towns, to the cities in one of the financially poorest countries in the world. We do the same in UK, one of the richest countries in the world, in Canada, in United States. However, there is no accessibility without affordability. And to make healthcare affordable, we need to understand where the real costs are. If you cut the cost in one way, 70% to all the costs sits in predictable, preventable diseases. Diseases that if we catch them early, a $10 problem 
does not become a thousand dollar solutions. If you cut it another way, two thirds of all the costs in healthcare sit in salaries. Doctors, nurses, healthcare professionals are among the rarest and it's relatively the most expensive assets of each country. So what we do in Babylon is on one hand, monitor, observe, take insights from the behavior of our members so that we can see their issues before they develop to help them to stay healthier. And on the other hand, when they do run into trouble, uh, problems, we automate as much as possible that our doctors, nurses, healthcare professionals have to do so that they can uh, focus on the top of their license. Most people, as you know, in healthcare do not do that. And as a result of that, what we have is a society in which all the $10 trillion sector that we have, money that we spend in healthcare, is spent on 50% of the world population. According to the World Health Organization, 50%, half of the humanity has no access to the most basic healthcare services. Five out of the seven billion people have no access to secondary care, cannot dream of a surgery when things go wrong. Einstein used to say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting different results. We now have an opportunity after COVID-19 to reassess the way we've been doing things and do things in a very different way. We lost far too much as a society to even contemplate to go back to our old ways. I myself lost my father, my most wonderful friend, to this dreadful disease. It is a betrayal of the price we pay if we go back to do things the way we used to do them rather than to look at things from new. COVID-19 forced us to start looking at the way we deliver healthcare in a fundamentally different way. What the system saw was that as soon as the pressure on the system grew, almost the entire functionality of the system at the beginning came to a halt, forcing everybody to rethink the way they've been delivering healthcare. So what we did in Babylon, for instance, was to deploy our technology and our capability and everything we have learned in the last five years to be able to deliver a very different model, which is today adapted by 8% of the population of UK, for instance, where we help some of our most in need communities to look after their uh, population. We managed to do so by dissecting the needs of the people into the categories and then serving each of those needs according to the most appropriate and simplest way for them to get satisfied. So first, for those who just wanted information or if they had symptoms and they wanted to decide if they need to isolate themselves or when they isolated themselves, they needed to monitor themselves. We created a digital layer that enabled them to do all of the above. And the cost of the delivery of that, as you will know, with digital is very little. It's about 50 cents, say, per delivery. For those who wanted to talk to a human being, we looked at the kind of questions people have and managed to train a whole set of professionals that we could put up on live chats to support COVID-19 uh, 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 suspect patients or those who were uh, in isolation, but we do so with um, under the supervision of clinicians and uh, healthcare professionals. The cost of delivery of that was $5. One in five times, only in 20% of our patients, we connected them for video consultations with our doctors. And that way we managed to protect the most in need resource that we all have. So while we quadrupled in Babylon the number of patients we had and the number of interactions we had with our patients, and like most others, we didn't have to go and scramble to find more doctors. We could do so almost with the existing population of our doctors that we had. Only one in 10 times our, monitor, our uh, telemedicine uh, services led to a referral to a clinic where the cost will, of course, as you know, bump up from, say, $50 an interaction to $500. And in very rare occasions, we had to admit patients into hospitals where the cost can be in thousands of dollars. That very disciplined funnel managed to achieve a number of things. One, 
Patient satisfaction remained huge. 93% net promoter score. Patients loved the fact that they had something, someone available to them 24 seven, but they were not calling on the uh, highest in demand resources of the uh, country. Secondly, the cost for the whole system was managing very well without any undue pressure on the system. And thirdly, we managed to keep our doctors uh, and safeguard their time so that they could see uh, the most in need patients that Babylon had. That system worked. But COVID-19 is not the only crisis we face in healthcare. For years, as you all know, we've been facing the crisis of chronic conditions. We've been facing with the pandemic of mental health. Every year, for the last decade, a million wonderful human beings committed suicide, took their own lives. We almost, as societies, took a blind, turned a blind eye to that disaster, that crisis that is facing our societies. It is not time to look at what we learn and redeploy the models of healthcare that have worked well for COVID-19 to deal with other chronic conditions that we have been suffering from all the time, from mental health, to chronic uh, conditions like diabetes and uh, COPD. It is time to change the way we've been delivering healthcare. It is possible to do so thanks to organizations like AWS for making cloud so widely available, to mobile networks, to the technology companies out there who have provided so much of the infrastructure we need. It is time to look at healthcare in a fresh way. We all paid far too high a price to go back to the way we were doing things. It is time to do it new. Charles, thank you so much for the opportunity you gave me to talk to uh, the people in this audience, and I'll send it. I'll send it back to you now. Thank you, Ali, for sharing what you and the Babylon team have developed. It's fantastic to see more and more digital health solutions designed to enable consumers and patients to take a more active role in their health. And now uh, let's look even more forward um, to longer term prevention with the development of vaccines. For this, we're heading out to Cambridge, Massachusetts to hear from Stefan Bansel, the CEO of Moderna, a born in the cloud pharma company that immediately sprang into motion to develop a potential messenger mRNA based vaccine against the novel coronavirus. Thanks, Stefan, for joining us. I pass you the mic. Thank you, Chef, and hello, everybody. Thank you for having me at this AWS conference, where I want to talk to you about Moderna's Corona vaccine. Before I start, let me remind you we are publicly traded. I will make forward-looking statements, and please check the, the SEC website before deciding to invest in the company to understand the risk. We started Moderna on the notion that messenger RNA is an information molecule. It's part of a central dogma of biology, it's a molecule that sits between DNA and protein, and it's an information molecule. And we thought that if we could find a way to make the technology work to turn messenger RNA molecules into medicines, we could create a new class of medicine next to small molecule from old pharma or a recombinant from the biotech industry. What got us excited is because messenger RNA is an information molecule and gets to make protein inside cells, is we could make dozens and dozens of medicines for which there is no medicine on the market. And that was, of course, very exciting to help many patients. We believe the probability of technical success to go from the lab to commercial was much higher because we make a natural protein and because mRNA is a platform. We also thought that because mRNA is an information molecule, if we invest in IT and in robotics, we should be able to go very fast in the lab but also into clinical development. And last but not least, because it's a platform, we use the same manufacturing plant to make all of our products, providing a great capital efficiency. So as we embarked on building this company, we were paranoid about failing and how not to fail patients. And so we decided to mitigate risk, to diversify technology risk that you see on the x-axis by trying six different technology of mRNA at the same time. You see in blue in left, intramuscular injected vaccines, and in orange on the right, 
IV injected drugs that go to the liver to make rare genetic uh, disease medicine for kids that have a rare genetic disease. On the y-axis, what you see is the biology risk. And we diversify biology risk just by having enough product, like human health portfolio of stock. And so we embarked on this totally unprecedented adventure, which was to put in the clinic 16 drugs at the same time, which had never really been done before by any biotech startup. 2019 was a very important year for us because in two of our six applications, we were able to get clinical data telling us that our vaccine and our systemic secreted protein uh, modalities had good clinical data. And so we decided to scale those two businesses because this is where the technology become very interesting with kind of copy and paste because you have a technology cassette and you drop genetic information into it. I have the genetic information of a virus for the vaccine, or the genetic information of humans for our medicine or therapeutics. The four modalities on the right, we are still exploring. We don't know as of today if they're going to be successful in the clinic or not. We will have to have a clinical data guide us. If they are successful, we'll move them into core modalities, and if they are not, we'll just shut them down. We are not done. Six modality is not the end of Moderna. It is the beginning. For example, we are working with Vertex on the seventh modality, which is not on the slide because it is still in the labs. It is making very good progress, and we hope soon to be able to bring this into the clinic to be able to test can we get through inhalation and money going into the lung to basically, in that case, replace genetic information for kids that have uh, cystic fibrosis. But if it works, because mRNA is a platform, we can do a lot of different medicines in two world. So let me spend two minutes on vaccine before talking about the corona vaccine. The piece that I think is the most important about vaccine is that we mimic a natural infection. Unlike old vaccine technology, we never give you the virus. What we give you is an mRNA molecule that we inject in you that contains the instruction for one of several proteins. In the case of a corona vaccine, it is one protein. When it's injected in your body, the ribosome in your cell will read that message like if it was an mRNA coming from your nucleus with your own instructions and will make the protein of a virus on demand. In the case of this vaccine, it's the spike S protein. The body will make this protein totally naturally, like a virus would have used your cell to replicate. So all the machinery is exactly the same, and it's presented to your immune system, to your B cells, exactly like a natural infection from a virus would be presented. And so we have seen very strong response from our data in the vaccine that we have done before. If you look at what do we know about this platform around vaccines, we have those 1,600 healthy volunteers in phase one and phase two. We have a good safety and tolerability profile, very consistent, with that of adjuvanted commercial vaccines. What we have seen in our vaccine is across the board, very good neutralizing antibodies. Those are the antibodies that come and bind to the virus to prevent the virus from replication in your body that will eventually lead to disease. So let me talk about the corona uh, vaccine for a minute. We have been able to move very fast. Uh, we got the sequence posted online by the Chinese uh, on January 10. By January 13, our team had locked down the design of a vaccine. The product design was done in a few days. Usually this process will take several years testing in animals. And then in two months, we're in the clinic uh, in Seattle. We announced a big partnership with Lonza on May 1. At the end of May, we started phase two. And last week in mid-June, we got confirmation from the FDA or green light to go into a phase three, the last clinical study, 30,000 healthy volunteer participant, placebo control, and it's on track to start in July. So you would ask me, how could you go so fast? Uh, well, a few reasons. If you look at benchmark before, it took 20 months, as described by Dr. Fauci, for the SARS vaccine to go from sequence of a virus to starting a clinical study. It took us 63 days, that's two months. So how could we go from 20 months to 63 days? A few reasons. There is no magic bullet, but a few things that made that possible. Number one, 
mRNA is an information platform, as we discussed at the beginning. And so we are able to work directly from the raw material, which is genetic information. Two, it was not our first rodeo. We had done nine vaccines before. This was our tenth vaccine. So we learned a lot around our technology, our formulation processes, and it was very useful, as you can imagine. Third is we had already worked on coronaviruses. For around the last two years, working with NIAD, the division of NIH that like Dr. Fauci leads, we had worked among other viruses on MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which, as most of you know by now, is also a coronavirus. And so we had the chance in very detailed animal testing to try different protein, to try fragments of protein, to figure out the best design we could do to get a very good protection in a MERS uh, vaccine. What is uh, good to know is that last week we submitted online a manuscript uh, co-authored by NIAD, showing that we had full protection in mRNA 1273, which is Moderna's corona vaccine product. Of course, the team had done amazing work, uh, working seven days a week now for five months, and our manufacturing sites. It is fully digital. It is all in the cloud in AWS. Uh, we use machine learning toolbox from AWS to do uh, the design engineering of our products to also do some part of our quality control. The site is fully integrated uh, from raw material. Then we make the mRNA, we formulate it, we put it into vials, we do quality control on site, all connected over machines into our ERP system into AWS, and that goes into directly clinical trial sites. As we had to face the pandemic, we had to move from 100 million doses per year at our Massachusetts plant, which for most vaccine is a huge volume. But when you are facing a pandemic and up to 8 billion people on the planet, that is a small number. So we uh, gave ourselves a challenge. How do we do 10x? How do we go from 100 million doses to a billion doses? And so we partnered with Lonza, one of the best companies in the world for contract manufacturing for pharmaceuticals. They are based in Switzerland and they have a very, very strong network of plants. Mm. What enabled us to move very quickly to Lonza is again AWS. Why? We were able to basically do copy and paste of the sites of Massachusetts into the new units of Lanza by just being able to replicate that very quickly into a cloud. If we had done it the old way, we would still be talking about it because it would have been such an effort. But being in AWS made it very easy. So where is Moderna now? We have two uh, medicines that are in phase three or starting uh, to prepare for phase three six in phase two or preparing for phase two, 12 in phase one. We've had already 12 positive clinical readouts, including eight vaccines. If you look at the portfolio of 23 medicine in development, we have seven vaccines that are first in class vaccine, meaning there is no vaccine on the market today against any of the virus that we're working against. Five immuno-oncology drugs in the clinic partnered with either Merck or AstraZeneca. For rare genetic disease medicine, for kids that are missing one enzyme out of 22,000 genes in their DNA, one instruction in their liver. And we're getting the technology to be able to replace that instruction set that is faulty from the DNA of our parents into uh, this product. We have also a new entry into autoimmune disease with two new medicines. More than 2,000 people have been tested with our technology and we will phase three starting soon it will be soon 30,000 people that have been dosed by Moderna's technology. The team is getting close to 1,000 people. We talk about the plant in Norwood, Massachusetts, and Lonza. We've had a lot of partnership over the years. Four partnerships with Merck, three partnerships with AstraZeneca, a partnership with Vertex, but also Department of Defense via DARPA, Barda from HHS, and the Gates Foundation. And as you can see, we have a very healthy balance sheet with multi-year runways. So with this, I would like to thank you for the invitation today uh, to uh, this AWS conference, and I would like to send it back to Chef. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. It's incredible to think how your team was able to be so agile that in just 25 days, you go from a virus sequence selection to the first clinical batch of a new potential messenger mRNA vaccine. 
So in closing, I hope you enjoyed the presentations today. I wanted to share with you that in the spirit of empowering collaboration between researchers and clinicians globally, Elsevier, which is a global leader in information analytics in science and health, and AWS are collaborating to offer free access to a set of biomedical research tools and content at the Elsevier Coronavirus Research Hub. So you'll want to check out that link. It's in the session console and you get access to that free content. You know, we believe by making it easier for anyone to access important research, we can help researchers and life science companies accelerate efforts um, to address the current uh, coronavirus pandemic. So we now invite you to explore the rest of the uh, sessions and presentations that are available throughout the console. You will find four tracks to choose from. Um, there's a healthcare business track and a healthcare technology track, a life science business track and a life science technology track. Each track will kick off directly after this presentation. And then all the sessions will be open for on-demand viewing. Upon the track kickoffs, you can choose sessions of interest in any order, any time at your leisure. Finally, please be sure to leave us some feedback on the sessions uh, using your star rating tools so we can continue to provide the most relevant information that you want to hear about. Thanks so much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure presenting to you and it's been great to have our customers and partners on with us. Thanks again. Have a great rest of your day.